So, dear friends, as it is now uh, 4 p.m. Helsinki time, 8 a.m. Uh, Bogota time, and uh, 3, no, sorry, uh, 2, a, 2 p.m. Dublin time, we can begin. Uh, and on behalf of Historians Without Borders, um, I will welcome you all to this uh, web seminar uh, on conflict and history in Colombia. Uh, I am Erki Tuomioja. I am chair of the uh, Finnish NGO uh, Historians Without Borders and also of the International Network of Historians uh, Without uh, Borders. Uh, this is an informal network that was uh, established uh, six years ago uh, when we had the first conference uh, uh, arranged by Historians Without Borders here in Helsinki. Uh, and the international network uh, is, uh, has several hundred uh, people uh, who have joined uh, and anyone who is interested in joining can do so uh, by accessing our website historianswithoutborders.fi and join. And if you accept the uh, principles of our uh, founding declaration, you are free to join. There are no membership fees or anything like that. So you're very welcome to, to join us. Uh, and the, our organization in Finland acts as the secretariat for this international uh, network. Uh, this is the second time that we have arranged a web seminar for our network. Uh, the first one was with Timothy Gatton Ash a few months ago, and we are hoping to arrange several as long as we uh, are still uh, prevented from having any physical uh, meetings. But this um, uh, discussion will also be recorded and it can be accessed later uh, through our web page for those who uh, cannot uh, join us uh, uh, today. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, before this event, I took a brief refresher course in Colombian history uh, and uh, Eamon and I are both come from countries which also have experienced uh, civil wars, uh, but it is almost a hundred years ago or more that when we had our events, of course, Ireland has had its share of political violence also afterwards, but all our experiences pale in comparison what has taken place in Colombia uh, during several decades. Uh, so the history of Colombia is must always be present uh, uh, every day. And here we are today uh, discussing what is the role of uh, history in the Colombian peace process. This is what, what about historians without borders is about. Uh, we are uh, trying to see what historians could do uh, to help in conflict prevention and in conflict resolution and remove the use of history in fostering uh, conflicts and preventing uh, resolution of conflicts. And we have two distinguished speakers here today. We have Eamon Gilmore, who is the EU Special Representative for Human Rights, but also continues to uh, act as the EU Special Envoy for the peace process in Colombia. He is a former uh, Deputy Prime Minister and uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs in Ireland, uh, party leader, uh, and now he is working uh, at the European uh, Union. And uh, Maria Emma Wills is an associate professor of uh, political science at the University of Los Andes in Colombia, uh, which she has uh, held since 2005. And she has also been involved uh, in several ways with the peace process in, in, in Colombia as advisor to the chair of the National Center for Historical Memory. Uh, at the uh, administrative office of the president of uh, Colombia uh, some years ago. So uh, I will first give the floor to Eamon, who will give a presentation with the title Colombia, Making Peace and History Rhyme. Uh, so please, Eamon, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Erki, for the uh, introduction and for the honor and privilege of uh, speaking to Historians Without Borders today, and uh, especially to join uh, Professor Wills uh, in this uh, meeting. <clears throat> I became the uh, European Union's Special Envoy for the Peace Process in Colombia uh, just over five years ago. 
And uh, during that time, I have seen uh, how much the history of Colombia has influenced the conflict, the peace process, and indeed uh, how it continues to influence uh, events today. I have chosen the theme Making Peace and History Rhyme as the title of, of my talk for two reasons. Firstly, I'm not a historian, uh, but I have always felt that perhaps formal history attach, uh, attaches too great an attention uh, to the history of war and conflict uh, and not enough attention uh, to the history of making peace and of people living in peace. Um, and therefore, the idea of peace and uh, history rhyming uh, is uh, a theme that I would like to develop. But secondly, uh, it resonates with a passage from one of Ireland's greatest poets, Seamus Heaney, uh, who spoke of hope and history rhyming, uh, about which we heard indeed quite a lot uh, during the recent uh, inauguration ceremony of President Biden uh, in Washington. Uh, and that uh, phrase, uh, that passage about hope and history rhyming comes from Seamus Heaney's first venture uh, into drama, a play called The Cure at Troy, at Troy, which was Seamus Heaney's adaptation of the Sophocles Greek tragedy uh, based on the Trojan War. And of course, as with many Greek tragedies, it still resonates today. It is about the conflict between personal integrity and political expediency. It is about the ways in which the victims of injustice can become devoted to the contemplation of their wounds uh, as the perpetrators are to the justification of what they have done. And Heaney, of course, wrote uh, that uh, play uh, against the backdrop of the violence that was raging in Northern Ireland uh, at the time. And Heaney's words are fundamentally about choosing hope to make a better history and not always allowing the past to define the future. In Colombia, peace and hope have become synonymous. Um, but the history of the country, uh, as histories of countries do everywhere, continues to influence politics. Uh, and in some respects, I think, is also uh, raising obstacles uh, to the future of peace uh, in Colombia. When I think of the history of Colombia, uh, I think of two things. Uh, it is, of course, a very old history. Uh, one that long predates uh, the uh, arrival of uh, Europeans uh, and a very rich history, uh, particularly of its uh, indigenous uh, peoples. But there are two things that stand out for me in the more recent history of, of Colombia. The first is that Colombia is one of the oldest and longest enduring democracies in the world. For more than 200 years, uh, since its independence in the uh, second decade uh, of uh, the 19th uh, century, uh, Colombia has been a continuous uh, democracy with uh, just one interruption, uh, which was in uh, the mid uh, 1950s, a period of uh, four, four years of, uh, of, of military uh, rule. Um, it is a democracy that is almost as old as that of the United States and with a very similar uh, system uh, of government. The second uh, thing that stands out in the history of Colombia for me is that that two centuries plus of democracy has been punctuated with horrific levels of political violence uh, and other forms uh, of violence in almost every generation. Uh, I think, for example, of the War of the Thousand Days, which began in 1899, where around 120,000 people died in a civil war between the Liberals and the Conservatives. The conflict between FARC and the government uh, of Colombia, which lasted for more than 50 uh, years, 53 years, most recent conflict, which led to the uh, peace agreement uh, between uh, the government and FARC, was also a product of that rolling uh, waves of violence. One period of violence comes to an end, another is almost uh, begot. Uh, in this case, uh, it grew really from the period of violence known as La Violencia, 
which lasted for about uh, 10 years, which was really sparked off by the murder of the liberal leader Gaetan in Bogota in 1948. Uh, 140,000 people killed in that period uh, of, uh, of time. And eventually that phase of violence uh, was brought to an end in the late 1950s by an agreement which was brokered between the Conservative and the Liberal Party leaders. The two parties, uh, which were the two largest parties in, in Colombia, effectively agreed to rotate power um, in what was known as uh, the, the National Front. Uh, and the arrangement basically uh, gave rise to one where in each alternating uh, period, there is a liberal government, liberal president, and a followed by a conservative uh, um, president. And that arrangement put an end to the worst of the violence. Uh, it ushered in a new period of relative political uh, stability. However, it closed the political system to new entrants and emerging forces. And it gave rise to a sense, particularly in uh, many remote parts of the, the country, many rural parts of the country, uh, that this was essentially a deal between the Bogota elites. Uh, and many people outside of uh, in many parts of the country uh, felt disenfranchised by that uh, arrangement. Uh, a number of the rural militia that had formed during La Violencia uh, refused to accept the legitimacy of the central government and in many cases asserted their autonomy, forming so-called independent republics uh, in different parts uh, of the countryside. Um, these republics are often cited today by some in Colombia who warn against the uh, communization of the country or what is called Castro uh, Chavismo. Um, they, they, they remember that this uh, that, that this was taking place at a time uh, when uh, Castro had uh, come to power in uh, in Cuba. Uh, che Guevara, the the uh, uh, whole uh, emergence of um, armed uh, activity by mainly uh, left wing forces in uh, a number of countries in uh, in, in in Latin America. Uh, so what happened in, in Colombia was that after a period of what we might call reluctance tolerance towards these uh, republics, the central government's attitude hardened and it began uh, offensive actions against uh, these groups. Uh, and arising from that, uh, a number of insurgency groups emerged, the, the main one being FARC, uh, which emerged uh, in 1964. And that really was the beginning. Uh, of what became one of the oldest um, and bloodiest uh, armed conflicts uh, in the world. FARC, of course, were not the only uh, organization. There were several other left-wing guerrilla movements, uh, the M19, the EPL, the ELN, uh, and then uh, there emerged various paramilitary groups, uh, which came to be a reaction uh, to the perceived threats uh, from these uh, guerrilla movements. Most of these uh, groups have now disbanded or been uh, demobilized with the exception of the ELN. Uh, and of course, there are still uh, dissident and uh, illegal armed groups, uh, some of which have grown out of uh, previous uh, processes. While the reasons for fighting varied from one group to another, uh, the conflict was largely concerned with issues relating to political participation, uh, political reform, political revolution, um, particularly of uh, left wing movements, uh, issues relating to inequality, uh, resources, and especially about the issue of access to land uh, and land reform. In the 1980s, I think there was a migration of that uh, conflict. Um, uh, uh, and something of a merger, not entirely, but something of a, a merging with the uh, with the, the the drug trade, the illegal drug trade, with drug trafficking, extortion, kidnapping, uh, illegal uh, mining, all of which allowed these groups uh, to strengthen their military capacity. Control of the drugs trade, of course, has been a central element uh, even since the peace agreement was signed, with illegal armed groups moving into territories vacated uh, by FARC, and since the uh, disbanding or partial disbanding of the paramilitaries in the 
late 2000s, uh, organized crime has also increased uh, their share of this lucrative market. And that has come hand in hand with a strategy for control of the regions and the civilian uh, populations. Over that period of time, over that uh, 53 year period of time from 1964, uh, that conflict uh, in Colombia um, claimed the lives of 240,000 people. 240,000 people killed. 100,000 people disappeared. 7.7 million people displaced from their homes. 9 million people uh, victims uh, in, in one way uh, or, uh, or another. Bringing that to an end is an enormous uh, task and was a task that had to be undertaken with very careful negotiation, um, uh, including uh, a lot of back channel negotiations which took place before formal talks began uh, in, 20, uh, in 2012. And of course, I might also say that that was in turn preceded by many repeated attempts over the decades, over the previous two decades, to try and bring the conflict uh, to, to an end. Um, but um, uh, as we've seen in, in many countries, including indeed in my own, uh, the process of peace building is not just about the signing of the agreement, it's what's done afterwards. And in Colombia, uh, there are deep ideological divisions in politics, deep divisions in society, inequality, poverty, disenfranchisement, as well as a lack of infrastructure and state presence in many parts of the country. And these problems do not just disappear overnight. And that becomes the first challenge of any successful peace agreement, bridging the gap between the promise of peace and the reality uh, uh, that uh, building it requires hard work. Uh, this, of course, has to be done by Colombians in the first instance, but also with international support. And I want to say a couple of words about the international support uh, for the, the peace process in, in Colombia. Firstly, uh, the guarantor countries. There were two guarantor countries, Cuba and Norway, uh, without whom the peace agreement could not have been uh, made. Uh, the United Nations played a critical role in, uh, towards the latter end in the negotiation, but also in the early stages of the, uh, the implementation of the disarmament process, uh, and indeed is continuing to play a critical role in the implementation of the, uh, of the agreement. Uh, the European Union, uh, along with the United States, uh, was asked to support the process and the negotiation uh, process, which we have, uh, which we have done, um, and not just since the negotiation process itself. Uh, as far as the European Union has been concerned, uh, we have been engaged in peace building in Colombia for about two decades prior to that. An emblematic example was the Peace Laboratories project which was focused on how to grow peace from the ground up by addressing the root causes and promoting economic and regional development, human rights and democratic uh, governance. One of the important contributions that I think that the European Union contributed to this process was its own experience of, of peace building. Uh, the, the story of the European Union itself, that it grew out of horrific conflict on the, con on the continent uh, of Europe, that it was born uh, to uh, promote uh, peace, that we in Europe know how difficult it is to overcome history, to build a prosperous and stable future, um, that the most difficult times come after the formal agreements have been signed, uh, that the hard work of cultivating reconciliation and peace in communities uh, and reincorporating ex-combatants uh, into civil civilian life requires uh, a lot of work. And that was the work that, uh, that I was appointed uh, to, uh, to, to contribute to as special envoy for the peace process uh, in Colombia. It was originally envisaged that I would support the implementation of the peace agreement. At the time I was appointed, it was anticipated that that agreement was, uh, was imminent. As it turned out, it wasn't quite as imminent as uh, was hoped for, and therefore I became uh, more involved in uh, meeting with the negotiating teams and uh, spent quite an amount of time uh, in Havana uh, on different uh, occasions before the agreement was signed. And indeed, after the agreement was signed, because that, of course, was put to a plebiscite in October of 2016, uh, but it, it failed to get a majority. 50.2% um, uh, of uh, the voters voted against the agreement, 49.8% uh, voted 
uh, in, in favour. So the negotiators went back to Havana, went back to the table, uh, made several changes, and the revised final agreement was signed on the 24th of November uh, 2016. It's a very comprehensive agreement. It has often been cited internationally as a model because of its ambition, its innovation, uh, and its determination uh, to um, address not just the conflict itself, but also uh, the specific causes uh, of, the, of, of, the, of the conflict. It's in six very comprehensive uh, chapters. To implement such a complex agreement, uh, it's essential that all parts of the agreement are implemented as they are interdependent in addressing the causes of the conflict. Dialogue between the parties is key, uh, and that it is, and, and therefore it's important that the institutions which are set up under the agreement function well uh, to provide the space for dialogue. Supporting the implementation, uh, the European Union created the European Fund for Peace in Colombia, um, uh, totaling 127 million euros, in addition to funding from member states. Um, uh, the projects from uh, that fund focus on peace and stabilization, and particularly on rural de development and the reincorporation of ex-combatants. The agreement allocated different areas of responsibility to different parts of the international community. In the case of the European Union, it was for rural development, the reincorporation of um, ex-combatants into civilian life, and the establishment of a special investigation unit in the uh, Prosecutor General's uh, office. In addition to supporting projects in these areas, we have also supported a number of other elements of the peace agreement, including through providing support for the transitional justice system. We've also participated in the National Commission for Security Guarantees, which is tasked with the creation of a public policy to dismantle the remaining illegal armed groups. Much has been achieved over the past four years. Uh, countless lives have been saved. Uh, FARC has demobilized, disarmed, uh, converted into a political party now known as uh, Communes. The uh, comprehensive transitional justice system envisaged in the agreement is now up and running. And the HEP, which is the Transitional Justice Court, has just handed down its first major ruling, which formally accuses former FARC commanders for kidnappings committed during the armed conflict. Should they accept this ruling and avail of the restorative uh, sentences envisaged in the agreement, this will be truly historic. Former combatants accepting accusations of war crimes, of crimes against humanity, from a tribunal that they negotiated uh, to create uh, in a peace agreement. Transitional justice is a vital part of any peace process to ensure that the needs of victims are never forgotten. Ignoring the truth destroys the possibility of putting the past to rest and undermines the future. It is important that all who have submitted to the transitional justice system give a full account of what happened uh, during uh, the conflict. But it is also important that we look forward uh, and that we learn from the lessons uh, of history. And perhaps one of the big lessons of history in Colombia is the extent to which uh, phases of violence are brought to an end and then new violence starts to, uh, to re-emerge. And one of my major concerns now in relation to the peace process in Colombia relates to the killings of social leaders, human rights defenders, and ex-combatants. Uh, I'm alarmed by the recent massacres of civilians, the deterioration of the humanitarian situation of local communities, which has created considerable fear. According to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, more than 400 human rights defenders have been killed in Colombia since 2016. This is truly shocking. Human rights defenders are the lifeblood of their communities, defending their rights and the rights of others, safeguarding democracy and working to building a lasting peace. And many pay a terrible price for their courage. I recognize, of course, that the past few months have been very difficult for many, that the fear, uncertainty, and hardship of the COVID-19 pandemic have been compounded by tragic reminders that insecurity and inequality are still daily realities in some parts of the country. Human rights defenders are even more important in that context. Their protection is and must remain a priority for the government. A comprehensive approach aimed at a more effective protection of the population at risk is needed, notably through collective protection measures. Those responsible for the attacks 
including the intellectual authors, must be brought to justice. The EU stands ready to further support Colombia in its efforts to reverse this tragic trend. The comprehensive presence of the state in rural areas needs to become a reality, not just a security presence, but also an effective civilian presence with social services. Sustainable development, including through addressing illegal economies and illicit drugs, goes hand in hand with security. Nelson Mandela once said, after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. For a population long used to living in the middle of conflict and with yet uh, many to see the dividends of peace, it can be difficult to leave history behind. It is clear that many deep divisions remain. Polarization and dogma dominates the political discourse and that only increases the risk of another cycle of violence and conflict. For peace to rhyme with history, all Colombians must participate and invest in a more equal and inclusive society. A culture of peace needs to take hold and it can only do that if it is driven by all actors. The future does not have to reinforce or repeat the mistakes of the past. Respect, empathy and the protection of human rights must always be our guide even in the most difficult of circumstances. Peace and hope may be synonymous in Colombia, but they have to be acted upon in order to make peace rhyme with history. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, uh, Avon, for this uh, presentation. It's a lot of food for thought, but we will continue immediately with uh, Maria M. Wills uh, from Bogota. Please, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for the words and the thoughts of uh, um, Mr. Gilmore, because I agree with his take on the history of Colombia and what happened after the signing of the peace accord. But what I'm going to talk about is not so much about the history of the conflict, but how the history or how we speak about the conflict has become one of the major fissures within the Colombian society and how history is being used by all sides to legitimize and justify the polarization that is going on. But uh, I've, I have a small presentation, it's a very short presentation, but I always speak with the PowerPoint, it helps me to organize my thoughts. But before, before I start with the presentation, I want to say two things. First of all, when I was part of the Center for Historical Memory in Colombia, I worked with school teachers on a toolkit about the history of the conflict. So one first dilemma that we face when we go through conflict and then into peace for historians, I think, is how will you teach the history of the country in the school, in the schools? Um, some say that you should not speak about the conflict and you should not speak about history in the school, but I think that you should open up the conversation around history. So the dilemma is not whether you speak about history of the conflict, but how you speak about the conflict. What kind of pedagogy are you going to use so that the, the, the conversation around the past, instead of fueling the war, um, grounds peace at the territorial level. So, um, first thing, the past will always be um, used and, and, uh, and polemic and contentious. So, it's not whether you speak about conflict, but how you speak about conflict, which is really the question for historians, school teachers, and universities. Um, that's, that's like my, my take on, on before I start with my presentation. So uh, I think that history has become one of the major stakes of the polarization in Colombia because we have two major views on what happened in Colombia. Let me 
go. So how we name the past is at the center stage of the political disputes in Colombia. The naming, the language historians and citizens use to uh, address the past has become very contentious. And the, the naming of the past has become the great marker of the blocks, of the political blocks, uh, uh, either fighting for peace, for the peace accord to take, uh, to take place in Colombia, or to undo what was agreed upon in the peace negotiations. So let me let me say very briefly, whoops, very briefly, what are the two blocks around the past? So on one side, you have uh, a block that says that we did not live through uh, an armed conflict. We had a terrorist attack upon a state that was legal and that was legitimate. So for those those in that block, we should not speak about armed conflict, and we should uh, point at the fact that those who took arms were just criminals. There was no political side to those who took arms in the 60s uh, of, uh, of the 20th century. On the other side of, of, uh, of that block, you have those who say we, we lived through uh, a conflict, an armed conflict, and that was because the, the democracy that we had, the regime that we had, was a very sort of limited democracy. And moreover, in the 60s, where, as uh, Dr. Gilmer explained, we had this agreement, this elitist agreement that four years in power of the conservatives and four years of the liberals. So during that time, we had many guerrillas pop up around the country and those guerrillas did have an agenda, a political agenda. And upon that political agenda, you had many social movements that claimed um, for, for a more egalitarian Colombia. So to say it briefly, on one side you have those who say no armed conflict, just terrorists. On the other side, you, you have all the social movements and citizens and historians speaking, speaking through language about armed conflict. So first thing I would, would like to point out is that historians, when they speak about the past, they use words and those words become contentious. There is no neutral way to speaking about the past in a neutral fashion. Um, and in, in, that, that, in that language, you always, to a certain extent, have to reflect on, on, on your side, on where do you stand up vis-a-vis -vis, uh, that past. So, um, it, while, while I was working in the center, in the Historical Memory Center, I, I want to give you one example of these battles. We worked with the security forces in Colombia. We wanted to work with the security forces because there's no peace agreement that survives the agreement if you do not have the security forces as allies of the peace agreement. So we worked with them and there in that work and, and, uh, and having these conversations with them, I really became aware of how hard it is to convince the security forces after such a long conflict that you have to turn around the views they have built upon the conflict in order to have the, the country go forward into peace. What were the disagreements with the security forces? For the security forces, there was no arm, uh, armed conflict. There was more a kind of illegitimacy upon the, the actors, the, the guerrillas, and those guerrillas 
did not have any moral or justif uh, any justification for what they did. Um, in, what I wanted to point out there is that there is a moral, a moral um, view on history, and that moral view sort of threads what you see in that history. So the security forces didn't see any kind of moral standing in, in the guerrillas. The guerrillas were seen more as the illegal and the illegitimate actors that had attacked a state that was democratic and that had a rule of law. In that sense, um, let's say that the security forces have a kind of black uh, dichotomous view of history where there are bad guys and good guys. The good guys are within the state frame and the security uh, forces are, of course, uh, the good guys and bad guys who were uh, part of the guerrillas. Those security forces or those agents that committed atrocities within the armed conflict were called by the security forces rotten apples. They, the security forces don't have um, a systemic view of what happened during the armed conflict. In other words, they see each event as if it was an event, uh, 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 an exceptional event within the war. They don't see patterns they don't ask questions about what were the conditions for those patterns. The, the, those who committed disappearances, for instance, in Colombia, coming from the security forces, uh, uh, did not have conditions that made, that made possible those disappearances. They were just within their own forces, rotten apples. So the view they have of the past, the view they construct of history is made up of good guys and bad guys. And within themselves, there are certain bad guys, rotten apples, but they cannot name the problem as a systemic problem. They cannot face the fact that the disappearances they committed had conditions that probably made available for their own forces to commit the scrams as if they were normal. On the other side of, of, of that view, you have those who say that all actors of the armed conflict, and, and we name in the historical center, we do not name legal, we do not name the actors of the conflict as illegal or legal, because if you name them as legal or illegal, what you are introducing within the discourse of history is a sort of moral asymmetry. And so in, instead of, of putting certain actors in a better, in a more moral position, we talked only about actors, armed actors, without qualifying them. And we try to reconstruct in, within those armed actors the repertoires of violence that they use to further their strategies and their interests. But what I'm trying to say is that um, if you introduce the, the legality discourse in the historical construction of the past, what you are bringing without wanting probably is a very moral standing within the conflicts that were taking place in the country. So first thing, we try to speak about actors in the same level. All actors were armed and none had the privilege, let's say, of being legal or illegal. The second thing is that when we talked about victims, we used uh, humanitarian law, international hum humanitarian law, to look at the repertoires. There, um, 
we wanted to point out that not only there were human rights that were violated by the state forces, but also the guerrillas had committed atrocities within the armed conflict. And so we use uh, humanitar international humanitarian law to point out that the patterns of violence by both, uh, say, blocs, guerrillas and state forces were atrocious and had committed crimes against humanity and had committed crimes uh, against war law. We, we never spoke about rotten apples because we assumed that history is not uh, incidental. Uh, the, the repertoires of violence we saw within the actors were not explained. The explanations of the violence couldn't be made through uh, uh, individual cases. We had to look for patterns and the patterns needed to be explained by looking at the conditions of pos possibility of those patterns. So that was a big disagreement. We saw patterns. We didn't see, you know, one disappearance and then the next one. We saw the patterns and then we ask ourselves, as historians or sociologists do, what were the conditions for those patterns to take hold in Colombia? That gave way to a, a, a third Conversa difficult conversation with the security forces. If they were patterns within the armed conflict, then what were the responsibility for the conditions put in place for those patterns to take hold? In other words, the conditions speak about agency in history because it was human decisions taken by either commanders of one side or the other that gave way to those conditions and gave way to the, the possibility of those patterns to take hold within the armed conflict. If you have responsibilities, then you have accountability. And if you have accountability, you can uh, not only look at the past as something that is past and ciao, never speak about it again, but as the past, as a way of pedagogically asking yourself what decisions led to such atrocities in order not to repeat the history of those decisions again. In a certain sense, when you speak about accountability in history, what you're trying to open up is the door for a different future. When you speak about accountability, what you're trying to say is, if we learn something about the past, then maybe, maybe in the future, we will take decisions that are different and that won't lead to such uh, extreme and cruel situations as the ones we live through the armed conflict. And finally, um, we spoke about systemic conditions, the conditions that that gave way to the atrocities within the armed conflict were not just uh, uh, not just one decision by made by one individual, but became enmeshed in threads of responsibility and agency that gave way to those atrocities. So that history becomes uh, like a tapestry, shall we say, a ta tapestry that weaves the conditions so that the actors become involved in, in reproducing that, that violence. <clears throat> Sorry. So let's say that history has become enmeshed in two very opposite ways. And in one, one side, you have a very organic vision of the past, a sort of um, say there is, there's no conflict, there are good guys and bad guys, patriotic guys and, and really bad guys, and 
um, if you see history that way, of course, you, you cannot acknowledge responsibilities and you cannot acknowledge the agency of the actors within, within uh, the society you live in. On the other side, you have the, the, the view that really you need to understand the social and political conditions that gave way to the armed conflict and you have a lot of social movements seeing, pardon, <clears throat> looking at the past through the lens of the conditions that gave way to the armed conflict and saying and asking for those conditions to be really a, seen as a challenge, not only for the state, but also for society so that the state and society can face those conditions and try to open up a different future. Um, another way of saying this is by thinking that conflict is not only resolved at the negotiation table, but also is resolved through the day-to-day -day lives of Colombians and we need to really speak about that conflict, but in a different way. We have to change the language. We are speaking about the past because the language that sees the past as a past made up of good guys and bad guys installs the conflict, installs the, the, the armed conflict within society. So um, I don't know if that idea came through very well, but anyway. And on, on, on the other side, and with that I finish so that we can uh, hear the questions that people that are connected have. On the other side, you have a society that says the conflict has been too long. There are no good guys and bad guys. There are patterns, very violent and cruel patterns, and many Colombians have suffered because of those patterns, and we need to acknowledge those patterns and the responsibilities around those patterns in order to move forward. That's it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. This was a very uh, moving and interesting presentation. And I now will open the floor. We have about uh, 12 minutes time for discussion and questions. So anybody who wants to take the floor, raise your hand, use that function or put it in the chat if you want to uh, put a question. But I will give the uh, opportunity to Eamon first if you want to respond uh, to these remarks. Uh, um, I'm happy if you go directly to questions, Erki. I know you're tight on time, so... I'll reserve what I have to say to responding to the questions. OK, thank you. At the moment, I don't see anyone asking for the floor, but I'm interested um, particularly, of obviously, in the role of historians. Uh, so um, uh, we are talking about history, but have we had any uh, historians involved in the peace process? Um, Maria Emmer mentioned, um, how are we going to write the history books? So, of the future for, for the future. And we have to have some sort of agreement between historians on how to present that history. Uh, and perhaps that should start, and uh, that is one of the ideas of uh, Historians Without Borders that we have tried uh, in other parts of the world also to bring together historians. We have had two uh, meetings with the Ukrainian and Russian historians, for example. And then that is also always a beginning uh, to, to have the sides listen to the narrative of the other side and hopefully later on come to some sort of agreement on how to uh, present the history. But is this too early days uh, for the Colombian conflict uh, uh, to involve historians uh, and how to tell history yet? Maria, please. Historians are already very involved <laughs> in the, the public conversations. I think that when you come from a, a, a country that, it, 
has gone through so many years and decades of uh, violence, political violence. Historians are very much involved in the history of that violence. So historians have been involved in that discussion. Um, and I think that it's important to say that historians are public figures. I mean, when they speak up in uh, through through the media or they 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 do have a resonance within the public sphere. So um, and OK, you ask whether it's too soon to have historians speak about what has happened in Colombia, I would say no. Um, we need to speak about what happened. I think the question is, how do you speak? And when you come from a, a country where, where there's so much polarization, the form is as important as the content. So if one historian, for instance, has a view saying we did not have um, a conflict, an armed conflict, we just had guerrillas that were terrorists because we, we had a democracy and so there was no need of arms. Um, and another historian that says, no, we did not have a democracy or the democracy was weak and limited. So we had these guerrillas and the guerrillas had an agenda. OK, you have two views, two, two opposite views. Let's talk about those opposite views, but without making the other view an, uh, a sort of um, demon, demon view. You, you cannot, I, I mean, the words with which you use to speak of the other historian and the view of the other historian, the, the words you use have to be so uh, delicate as not to convert the other, your enemy. Because if you speak about the other as an enemy, you are in the same war frame you had before. You have to speak, in other words, of uh, an adversary. Uh, do you say adversary? Uh, someone, a historian that doesn't share your view. And you have to uh, kind of argument around the methodologies and the way he or she or they constructed the view of the past they did. In other words, you have to take seriously the arguments of the other side. You really do have to take seriously the arguments and you have to take the conversation around how did you construct that argument? What were your sources? How do you come up with this view? Instead of, of thinking the other is crazy or I don't know, or, 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 or a guy that doesn't think. You really have to take seriously the reasonability, the, the, the reason behind the argument that he has given you and take the conversation around methods and methodology, because I think that the methodology is very important to, to, to have conversations that are not just polarized, but that really are about what happened. No, <laughs> not what you think happened or how you place yourself vis-a-vis -vis the conflict, but what happened and let's learn about what happened instead of um, rejecting any reflection of on the past. I don't know if I made myself clear, but. I think so very much. Eamon, would you like to come in? Well, I, I'd just like to make three points. I think, first of all, as I said at the very beginning of my contribution, I think um, all history is not the history of conflict and the history of war. Uh, there is also a history of peace and there is a history of peacemaking. And I think that uh, an interesting history to examine were the repeated efforts that were made in Colombia, uh, some of which were not successful, uh, to, to bring about um, a peace agreement or to negotiate uh, a peace agreement to negotiate an end uh, to the, the conflict. And included in that, I think, is the uh, very valiant efforts that have been made by people in civil society, the churches, 
uh, people in politics, people in different walks of, uh, of life. And I think that that's a history. In the, in the context of Colombia, I think that that's a history uh, worth uh, looking at. And I think it's worth looking at because I think it has relevance, not just for Colombia, but for many other countries in the world that, and many other regions of the world that are afflicted by conflict to learn the lessons of the peace agreement uh, in Colombia, as indeed Colombia uh, was very willing to learn the lessons of the peace agreement in my own country of Ireland. I recall many political figures and uh, public servants and uh, civil society figures uh, who visited Colombia in that period of time, visits in the other, uh, in the other direction uh, to try and learn that, that history. That's the first point I would make. Uh, the second point is, is that we, we need to recognize that one of the outcomes of the Colombian peace agreement is that we are seeing history in the making. And when I, I, what I mean by that is that the process, the transitional justice process that was established, the Truth Commission, the Missing Persons Commission, and particularly the HEP, provides a unique vehicle for the telling of the truth, for the perpetrators of whatever language one wants to use about uh, whether it was armed conflict or whether it was terrorism or whatever, but that there is a, a mechanism whereby those who were involved in that, both on the state side uh, and on the non-state side, can tell what happened and can tell what happened in the interests of victims uh, so that they know the, the truth and, and can get closure and in some cases can hopefully uh, trace their, uh, uh, their loved ones. And it was, that was one of the big innovations of the Colombian Peace Agreement is the facility that we have a means by which we can find out more than we would otherwise find out about what actually happened uh, in, the, in the conflict. And then the third point is, is that we learn the lessons of that history and that we um, uh, uh, use that uh, to uh, prevent it from, uh, from happening again or prevent from other types of violence from, uh, from arising uh, again, which I think is probably uh, the challenge that we are going to be faced with in Colombia over the uh, next uh, immediate period. Thank you. Um... It seems to me that uh, the situation in the country is still very fragile. Uh, uh, there is a peace agreement and there are several processes uh, ongoing, but uh, would, what, what do you uh, sort of uh, identify as the uh, uh, most serious threats which can derail the peace process? I don't think that the that the peace agreement, the, the agreement that was made between government and the, the FARC, I think that stands and that is being, uh, you know, that cannot now be unraveled. FARC have disarmed, have demobilized, have constituted themselves as a, uh, as, a, as a political party. But the agreement as a totality has to be implemented in, its, in all of its parts. And there are significant parts of it, uh, rural development, the issue of how to deal with illegal uh, drugs, uh, the issues relating to transitional justice and uh, victims, which uh, have to get a lot more attention. The most urgent issue, I think, is the security situation in the uh, in the territories, particularly uh, the safety for human rights defenders, for social leaders, uh, and, uh, former combatants. Uh, we've seen the, the, the numbers who are being killed is, is alarming, and that has to be addressed, and it has to be addressed uh, by the state working closely with uh, civil society and with uh, and, and with local uh, communities, uh, but I'm optimistic. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that we have to always. There's always a risk that we see, you know, what's what's going wrong without always, without looking at what what is going right. But a lot has been achieved uh, by the uh, by the peace uh, agreement. We're not uh, we're, nobody is going back. Even those who have a certain amount of rhetoric about the peace agreement. Uh, you can't go back to um, four or five years ago. Nobody is going to, you know, they, they, the plebiscite is over, the agreement was signed, it's being implemented. Uh, you know, there are issues around the implementations and about the implementation that have to be uh, have to be addressed. So I think that what we have to do is uh, look what needs to be done for the future, learn the lessons of, um, of, of um, learn the lessons of history. Um, uh, and, um, and, and, and build, uh, build on that. Thank you. Our time is uh, running out, but uh, Maria, I am, if you still want to uh, c conclude, please. 
Uh, well, I would say that I agree with uh, Mr. Gilmore in the sense that the peace process, even with difficulties, is a reality in Colombia. I mean, even if the government we have nowadays is not convinced and is against certain parts of the accord, the momentum of the peace agreement still is on. I mean, we are still within the frame of the peace accord. Where I have difficulty is I do think that the words matter and the, the way the government is framing and understanding what is happening in the regions of Colombia is a very simple way of thinking about the problem. Again, we are within the, 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 the interpretation of history, history in the, in the movie, in the present, in the sense that the government has a sort of very individual, I mean, for the government, there are criminals, that are make, making havoc in the territories of the lives of civilians. And that's, that's the, 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 the criminal framework through which it looks at the problem. I would say the problem is much more complex because those criminals have captured the state, the presence of the state in Colombia, in the regions. And so there are certain, um, bridges between those organized around criminal organizations and state and state functionaries and state employees and so the the problem is not just the bad guys against all who are within legality because within legality you have allies of those criminal organizations you have a criminal legality bridge do you say criminal? Well, you have a bridge between legality and illegality, and if you have to, if you want to overcome that that bridge of legality and illegality, you have to frame the problem in such a way that you recognize, acknowledge the the fact that there is no way you could you could um, overcome the violence just by thinking there are some bad guys, organized bad guys, that are making havoc in the region. So I think interpretation and language are very potent as tools. And if you have the tools to put the problem in its complex complexity in language, then you have part of the solution already there. So my take is that the government is simplistic simplistic in the way it looks at the problems that we're having vis-a-vis -vis the peace negotiations and the violence still going on. There are patterns. Sorry, sorry, I, it makes me really... <laughs> there are patterns of uh, killings going on in the country. Uh, and so you cannot say it's, oh, one guy murder here. Oh, one woman murder here. What are the patterns? Again, it's the same kind of framework that we had to talk about the past, but in the present. So talking about the past and the present uh, within the same framework is, is really the problem for me. Thank you very much. Uh, what you said about dealing with words, as historians, we are dealing with words. We are putting down words on, on paper and uh, uh, trying to present a view of history. So I think this is uh, very instructive for us. Uh, and uh, at least for those of us who have not been uh, directly involved with, with Colombia, this has been very informative, very educational, very instructive. But it is also just a beginning. I think that we need uh, to work further on also on the role of history in the Colombian uh, conflicts as, as well. Uh, and we are, there is no lack of wor work to do, neither for historians, diplomats and others who are trying to build uh, a lasting uh, peace in Colombia uh, and elsewhere as well. But unfortunately, we have to conclude. So thank you very much, Eamon Gilmore, for your uh, participation and Maria Emma Wills uh, for you participating.